War is the epitome of hell for all involved. As these words echoed around the Oslo Lecture Hall in December of 2019, it was still possible to believe that Ethiopia was on the cusp of change, that an era of freedom might be at hand. Stood on the stage, the leader of Africa's second most populous nation outlined his vision for regional harmony. A vision that had already ended a long-running border conflict with Eritrea, that had just seen the Nobel Committee hand him its prestigious annual peace prize. Aged just 43, Abiy Ahmed got a reassuring figure that day. Ethiopia's first prime minister of Oromo ethnicity, his smart suit and boyish smile offered a contrast to the cold Norwegian capital, a symbol of his youthful energy, of his promise of renewal. His words were reassuring too. His Nobel Prize speech littered with homilies about how peace is a labor of love. It's only with hindsight that these words came to be seen as loaded with irony. In the four years since that cold December day, Ali Ahmed has overseen a series of civil wars that taken together count among the deadliest conflicts this century. Tensions with neighbors too have been ratcheted up to boiling point, even as the thin fabric holding Ethiopia's many ethnicities together has begun to fray. So how did we get here? How did we get from Abby, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, to the warmonger who may soon unleash devastation across the Horn of Africa? In today's very long-form episode, we're going to dig into Ethiopia's recent bloody history and ask if Abiy Ahmed is really the most dangerous man on the continent. For those who lived through it, the 2010s protest movement that brought Abiy Ahmed to power was perhaps the defining moment in their lives. At the time, Ethiopia was coming off at the back of an incredible run of economic growth, but one that had been marked by a shriveling of opportunities. One in which a sclerotic political leadership had failed to distribute the good times to all. For almost three decades, Addis Ababa had been ruled by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, or the EPRDF, an umbrella party that included representatives of the country's biggest ethnicities. Forged from many of the groups that helped overthrow the Marxist Derg regime in 1991, it had initially promised a new chapter for Ethiopia. But as time went on, some of the country's ethnicities had come to feel increasingly marginalized. This was particularly true for the Oromo, Ethiopia's largest minority. In the mid-2010s, they began a series of protests that would shake the EPRDF and challenge the government. But it was only when other groups, like the Amhara, joined in that the nation's elite realized their position was untenable. In early 2018, the fallout from the protests had led to the Prime Minister's resignation. What followed was a backroom deal in which Abiy Ahmed was quickly elevated to power. I mean, 41 years old when he got the job, Dabi was a somewhat obscure choice. The former Minister for Science and Technology had previously worked in the military, as well as doing a stint overseeing cybersecurity. What he may have lacked in an impressive CV, though, Abby more than made up for in other ways. A major one was his background. An Aromo, Dabi could connect directly with the youth who'd led the earlier protests. Not that anyone expected him to be a conduit for Aromo grievances. With a Christian mother and a Muslim father, the new prime minister seemed like the perfect choice to represent a new, unified Ethiopia. Indeed, his guiding philosophy in the early days was something known as Madirma, an attempt to forge a common bond across the country's many ethnicities, to subsume division beneath a wider patriotism. In trying to explain it to a foreign audience, Abby summed it up this way. I like to think of Moderna as a social compact for Ethiopians to build a just, egalitarian, democratic, and humane society by pulling together our resources for our collective survival and prosperity. Not that Moderna was the only reason why Abiy won the top job. Another major one was his reformist zeal, a zeal expressed in his youthful energy and that boyish smile. After decades of being ruled by remote and out-of-touch elites, Abby felt less like a breath of fresh air, and more like a hurricane of change, a powerful wind that would sweep Ethiopia headlong into the 21st century. In a 2021 profile, the BBC summed up his early years as PM this way. He released thousands of political prisoners, lifted restrictions on the independent media, and invited the country's once banned opposition groups back into the country from exile. He backed a woman to become president, created gender parity in the cabinet, and established a ministry of peace. At the time, it felt like a quiet revolution, part of a wave of transformation that was sweeping the Horn of Africa. Just months after Abiy took power, pro-democracy protests toppled the longtime dictator in neighboring Sudan. But it would be what happened in the country of Eritrea to Ethiopia's north that netted Abiy his Nobel Peace Prize. 
In July of 2018, the new PM struck a deal with Eritrean dictator Isaias Afwerki, ending a long-simmering border conflict between the two nations. To outside observers, it seems like, after decades of authoritarianism, Africa's East was experiencing its own democratic spring. Yet all was not well beneath the surface. Just as few who visited Sarajevo for the 1984 Winter Olympics had any inkling of Yugoslavia's impending collapse, so could few of those applauding Abiy in Oslo in 2019 have guessed the extent of the problems besetting Ethiopia. Of the potent mixture of ethnic tensions and cold calculation that would soon drown the country beneath a tidal wave of blood. It would be a wave that Abiy Ahmed was destined to ride into infamy. With around 126 million inhabitants, Ethiopia is Africa's second most populous state, behind only Nigeria in terms of sheer manpower. It's also one of the continent's most diverse nations, with over 90 different recognized ethnicities and language groups. Of these, the biggest are the Oromo, who make up over a third of the population, and the Amharas, who make up over a quarter. Behind them, you get the Somali and Tigrayans, both comprising about 6%, followed by a litany of others we simply don't have time to list. What makes Ethiopia unusual, though, is the sheer extent to which ethnicity determines the shape of the state. Back in 1995, the post-Derg constitution divided the country into nine regions based on ethnicity. Since Abiy came to power, a series of referendums have removed one of those regions and added three new ones. The South Ethiopia Regional State and the Central Ethiopia Regional State, for example, only came into being in 2023. And the result is that Ethiopia today is made up of two autonomous cities, Addis Ababa and Dar Dawa, plus 12 ethno-linguistic states. Each of these doesn't just have its own leaders and power bases, but often its own paramilitary forces. They also have the constitutional right to break off from Ethiopia, a fact that has helped fuel some of the tensions straining the country today. Tension we can only hope to even remotely understand by taking a quick detour through Ethiopia's modern history. Specifically, we need to look at the ever-shifting balance of power between its major ethnicities. Now, to do a full overview of modern Ethiopia would take about 400 hours and end with me dying of exhaustion. So in lieu of that, here's just a basic overview that's going to hit some of the most important points. The first thing to understand is that modern Ethiopia spent most of its existence with the Amharas at the top of the ethnic pile. Think of an iconic person or place in Ethiopia, and there's a good chance that they're related to the Amharas. Haile Selassie, the Amharic language, Ethiopia's UNESCO-listed rock-hewn churches, all are part of the Amharan story. And that's because these guys were mostly in charge from 1855 to 1991. Even under the Marxist Derg, who overthrew Haile Selassie, Amhara's dominated elite life. That long era of rule only came crashing down in the early 1990s, when a coalition of ethnic militias finally chased the Derg from power. One of the key militias in this revolution? The Tigray People's Liberation Front. Drawn from the Tigray minority in the north, the TPLF was so powerful after 1991 that they were able to make their kinfolk the new Amhara, the guys who were mostly in charge. Despite being just 6% of the population, Tigrayans would dominate the coming decades. It was their candidate, Mela Zanawi, who led the country from 1991 to 2012, their TPLF party that wielded power in the ruling EPRDF. They were also the ones who oversaw the 1995 constitution. Remember that controversial clause on succession? Well, it was controversial because rival ethnicities worried the Tigrayans would expand their territory and loot the state before declaring independence if events moved against them. And speaking of independence, it was also in this era that Eritrea split off from Ethiopia, becoming a separate state. The move capped an Eritrean liberation struggle that had been started in the 1960s and ended with their partisans helping overthrow the Derg. But it also created a couple of problems. The first one we'll circle back to later in the video. With the exit of Eritrea, Ethiopia lost its Red Sea coastline, making it the world's largest landlocked country by population. The second was that it led to the Eritrea-Ethiopia War. Caused by disputes over the border between the two, the war lasted from 1998 to 2000 and killed 100,000 people and ended with a bitter, semi-frozen conflict on Ethiopia's northern frontier. The 2000 ceasefire deal included granting a boundary commission the right to adjudicate the border. But when it partially ruled in Eritrea's favor, Addis Ababa refused to implement the changes. Eritrea, you see, doesn't just border Ethiopia, it borders Tigray. By agreeing to the commission's ruling, the TPLF would have been surrendering parts of their home turf, so they refused. When Abiy came to power in 2018, implementing the ruling would be the key to his peace deal with Eritrea. In return for tax-free access to Eritrean ports, Ethiopia would surrender its claim to contested border territories, something only possible thanks to the dethroning of the TPLF. 
This dethroning was a deliberate act by non-Tigrayan elites, a quiet coup. Although the TPLF had overseen a huge economic boom, they'd also sidelined the Amhara and the Oromo peoples. In their eyes, they'd even oppressed them. The fallout from the 2010s protests gave the other ethnic parties in the EPRDF the cover to move against the Tigrayans, to elevate the Oromo Abbey at the expense of the TPLF. It was a plan the new PM soon took to its logical extreme. In November 2019, the EPRDF was suddenly disbanded. In its place, Abbey founded the New Prosperity Party, an umbrella organization that contained all of Ethiopia's major ethnic groups, with one exception. Their hold on power broken, the TPLF refused to join. Instead, they retreated back to Tigray itself, where they remained in undisputed control. It would be the brewing conflicts between the New Prosperity Party and the TPLF that soon unleashed Ethiopia's biggest military conflict in decades. So, that's the basic setup regarding Ethiopia's political and ethnic divisions. But it's also far from the whole story. So to really make sense of the apocalyptic violence bearing down on our narrative today, we need to go beyond just statistics and shady backroom deals. We need to go to a place that's extremely uncomfortable to even mention. Ethiopia's endless web of ancient hatreds. The key thing to understand is that most of the groups that we'll be discussing today don't just consider one another rivals like, say, the English and the Scots. They consider one another bitter enemies. Enemies who will not hesitate to oppress, persecute, or kill them if the opportunity arises. These fears are often rooted in history, but they're also practical, the result of lived experience. For example, the Amharas don't just dislike the Tigrayans because the TPLF replaced them as the elite in 1991. Rather, they're deeply aware of the TPLF's 1976 founding manifesto, which, to quote the Brussels International Center, called Amharas colonizers and the number one enemy needing to be eliminated. They're also deeply aware of the history of Western Tigray, the region Amharas call Welkate. From at least 1944 onwards, Welkate was a part of the Amharan lands, a fertile oasis in a swath of arid landscape that was key to their prosperity. But then the TPLF came to power and annexed Welkate into their homeland, renaming it Western Tigray. Since then, Amharan nationalists have been desperate to right this historic wrong. However, this is just the Amharan side of the story. Talk to a Tigrayan and they'll produce maps dating back to the 17th century which appear to show Western Tigray as part of their ethnic territory since time immemorial. They'll produce two documents that discuss how the Amharan elite engineered the Great Famine of the 1980s to specifically starve Tigrayans. Now, this is something that will come up time and time again in this video. The way Ethiopia no longer has a single history, but a plurality of histories based on ethnicity, and all of which serve to only reinforce ethnic claims to land or superiority. Oftentimes, these histories are actually relatively new. The New Humanitarian has documented how the issue of Welkate only became a cause celebre among Amhara nationalists during the 2018 protest movement. Other times, though, the grievances they recall are all too real and all too painful. Bitter memories in which every group has played the role of victimizer and victimized. Take the Oromo. While the Tigrayans and the Amharas loathe one another, the Oromo see them both as colonizers who took turns marginalizing and persecuting them. As a result, the Oromo have pushed harder for full autonomy than almost any other group. For their elites, the ideal outcome would be an Aromia, including the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa, that functions almost as an independent state. Yet it's not so simple as seeing the Oromo as the plucky underdogs in this fight. To fulfill their dream of an independent Aromia, Oromo extremists feel obliged to cleanse their land of other ethnicities, a huge problem when both Aromia and especially Addis Ababa have large Amharan minorities. Since the fall of the Derg, Amharans in Aromia have been systematically murdered and driven into exile. In 2021 alone, some 3,300 Amharas were killed by Aromo paramilitaries. On the outskirts of Addis Ababa, Aromo construction workers demolish Amhara homes under false pretenses. Over half a million have fled in recent years, refugees from sectarian violence. As a result, many young Amharas have been driven to join ethnic militia known as Farno, which they perceive as necessary self-defense forces. Yet the Farno were implicated in ethnic killings of their own, of civilians in Aromia, but also of those in the Beneshungul Gumuz region. On top of all this, the role of the federal government is also extremely complex and extremely open to interpretation. For the Amharans, who fear Aromo extremists, Abi is one of their persecutors, a leader under whom federal forces smash Farno militia but leave the Aromo be. 
Yet, the main Oromo force, the Oromo Liberation Army, or OLA, itself an offshoot of another group Abby made peace with in 2018, is in open rebellion against the government. We should also note here that when we say federal forces, we're talking about a government comprised of many ethnicities. There are Amhara and Oromo and Tigrayans in the Prosperity Party who stand against their region's ethnic militias and with Abi. So just bear in mind that when we use shorthand in this video, like the Amharas fought the federal forces, we don't literally mean all Amharas. The final thing to highlight is the role played by local media in adding rocket fuel to this dumpster fire of grievances. After ending many restrictions on journalists and liberalizing the media landscape, Abby has overseen an explosion in ethnically based news networks that exist solely to pump out dehumanizing propaganda against other ethnicities. At the end of this two chapter detour, then, hopefully, a couple of things are clear. One, this is not an easy story with good guys and bad guys. It's a gigantic mess in which everyone feels wronged against, everyone has legitimate grievances, and everyone variously plays the role of both oppressor and victim. One in which everyone also thinks they're in a zero-sum game in which their loss could lead to their extermination. And two, the whole of Ethiopia at this stage is like a teetering Jenga tower made out of dynamite. The whole edifice just one sharp push away from catastrophic collapse. Care to guess the man who'd come along soon with that fatal shove? You've probably got it right. Although his Nobel Peace Prize win in December 2019 marked the high watermark of Abbey mania in the wider world, back in Ethiopia the wheels were already starting to come off. While Medema's philosophy of Ethiopians coming together for the common good remained the priority on paper, on the ground it was clear that ethnic divisions were only increasing. In Oromia, OLA activity was ramping up against minorities. In Amhara, a coup attempt led to the death of the region's president and the assassination of the army's chief of staff. Meanwhile, an insurgency had broken out in the region of Beneshagogmuz, an ethnically mixed state that's home to entire peoples that we've not even had time to discuss in this video. This is yet another thing, just to keep in the back of your mind. While our main focus today will be on the Amhara, Oromo, Tigrayans, Eritreans, and federal forces, just know there are many, many more ethnicities out there, like the Afar or Walquates. And they, too, all have their own grievances some of whom will be involved in the upcoming collapse, and some of whom won't. As these internal struggles were building, external ones were beginning to exert pressure as well. This included one of the few truly national projects the Abbey government was working on, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, a project to dam the Nile. This would modernize the country's infrastructure, but was also causing tensions with Egypt. By the time Abbey went to Oslo to claim his peace prize, things had gotten so messy that the liberal thaw that marked his ascension had vanished. In his place, the Prosperity Party had turned to methods straight out of the old EPRDF handbook. That meant mass arrests, jailing people, including opposition MPs, without charge, silencing journalists. Unfortunately, this only seemed to play into the spreading ethnic narratives of persecution. So many Oromo were arrested, for example, that many young men joined the OLA's ranks in protest. Things got uglier still in 2020 when a Romo musician and former protest leader Hachalu Hundessa was murdered in Addis Ababa. In response, a Romo rioted across their region and in the capital, leading to around 200 deaths. Yet the Oromo weren't the only ones undertaking increasingly extreme actions. As the rest of the world was distracted by news of pandemics and lockdowns, Fano militias from the Anhara region were launching an increasing number of attacks on federal forces. When the push finally came that knocked this rickety tower over, though, it wouldn't be in Amhara or Oromia or Beneshangul-Gamuj, but in the far north of Ethiopia, in the region bordering Eritrea, hundreds of kilometers from Addis Ababa, the region known as Tigray. In the end, the trigger was an election, or rather, a lack of election. With the pandemic sweeping the world, Abbey's government indefinitely postponed a general parliamentary election scheduled for 2020. This was frustrating for everyone, since one of the promises of Abbey's rise to power had been the democratization of Ethiopia. Elections had been a key part of that. But while people across the country were annoyed by the decision, in Tigray, things reached a whole other level. Outraged, the TPLF declared that they would defy federal orders and hold the election regardless. Any attempt to stop the vote, they warned, would be an act of war. In September of 2020, the vote went ahead. Unsurprisingly, the TPLF won a resounding majority. No sooner was it over, though, than the first jolt came, the initial shove that would soon collapse everything. In the wake of the TPLF's regional victory, Abbey accused the group of attacking government bases and looting them for weapons. 
Even today, the accusation remains controversial. While plenty think the TPLF was overreaching, others think Abby was just looking for an excuse to hit them. Whatever the truth, the result was the same. On November 4, 2020, Abby ordered federal forces into the Tigray region on what was sold as a limited military operation, but in reality was anything but. Rather, it was the start of the Tigray War, a two-year civil conflict that's among the deadliest wars fought this century. A war Pulitzer Center journalist Anne Newman called as deadly as those conflicts in Darfur, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, and Crimea combined. At its height, a million men were fighting, with a thousand dying every single day. Overall, it's thought somewhere between 600 and 800,000 were killed, more than that died in the Syrian civil war. Quite possibly more than have died, even in Russia's war on Ukraine. Yet while the Tigray War would be ground zero for unbelievable atrocities, it would also be something else. A place where all those old ethnic hatreds finally boiled over, where Tigrayans, Amhara, and Eritreans, among others, would try to right the historic wrongs that had haunted them for so long. In doing so, they would open a new chapter in Ethiopia's story, one written not in ink, but in the blood of civilians. The speed with which the Tigray War went from limited military incursion to atrocity exhibition would have been spectacular to behold had it not also been so unremittingly awful. As Abbey's federal forces advanced on the region, the government cut all cell service and internet service, roads were blockaded, borders patrolled by armed guards. The result was a 50,000 square kilometer zone cut off from the outside world. Nothing could get in or out, including food. Now, if you've been watching this so far and wondering why we seem just so hostile to Abbey Ahmed, just know the Tigray War is when he showed his true face. The federal blockade was so bad that it led to hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths from famine. At its height, researchers at the University of Ghent estimated between 437 and 914 people starved to death every single day. As the Tigrayan civilian death toll climbed, Abbey began to display a messianic streak that was deeply unsettling. As Kenya-based analyst Rashid Abdi told CNN in 2021, in the initial stages of the war, actually, he spoke openly about how this was God's plan and that this was a kind of divine mission for him. If there was anything biblical about Abbey's war in Tigray, though, it was in a strictly Old Testament sense, a combination of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and a hyperviolent version of the Tower of Babel myth in which mankind isn't merely divided, but then begins immediately killing all of those who speak differently. Among those doing the killing were Amhara state paramilitaries and their Fano militias. Human Rights Watch released a shocking report during the conflict that documented in page after page of unrelenting detail the atrocities Amharan forces carried out, door-to-door massacres in Tigrayan villages, the burning of farmland and the slaughter of animals, piles of bodies so high that tractors were needed to drag them all away. Yet the Amharas didn't see themselves as the perpetrators in this war, but the victims. In the conflict's opening days, Tigrayan militants descended on the village of Mai Khadra, near the Sudanese border, and hacked hundreds of Amharan civilians to death. Hours later, Fano forces avenged their deaths by entering the same town and killing scores of Tigrayans. Still, we should be clear that the Amharan role in this war wasn't just exacting revenge, it was also righting one of those historical wrongs. In this case, that wrong was the 1990s annexation of Welkate by the TPLF, since renamed Western Tigray. Over the course of the conflict, Amhara state paramilitaries and the Fano would occupy western Tigray and drive the Tigrayans from the land. They'd likewise seize the southern part of Tigray that the Amharas call Ra. Now, if you're wondering why the Amhara, who so distrusted Abbey, would side with him in this war, well, here's your answer. It was the promise of western Tigray, plus fear of what a TPLF victory might mean, that motivated them. Not that Amhara region itself would be spared atrocities. In 2021, the TPLF rebounded from the initial attack on their region and seized the initiative. After driving federal forces into retreat, they launched an invasion of Amhara state. In our last video on the subject, we briefly used this brutal description. There, they destroyed hospitals, murdered civilians, and used sexual violence as an instrument of revenge. Similar acts were carried out by Tigrayan forces in Afar region, yet while the TPLF may have been trying to avenge Amharan atrocities in Tigray, the Amharas were far from the worst perpetrators of violence. From the war's early days, an outside actor had also joined in on Abbey's side, one that made even more of a mockery of the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. 
Now at peace with the Ethiopian state, Eritrea was more than happy to invade Tigray from the north. Over the course of the war, President Isaias Afwerki's troops occupied border areas originally promised to his nation by the Boundary Commission, ultimately snatching 52 districts. But since you're used to how things go in this carnival of misery, you'll also have guessed that Eritreans likewise ended up as victims. First, when civilians who'd fled Afwerki's regime to Ethiopia were massacred in revenge killings by Tigrayan forces, and secondly, when the TPLF counterattacked and drove the Eritreans back over the border, killing so many in the process that Afwerki was forced to start conscripting middle-aged men. Ultimately, though, only one side could prevail in this horrific war. While the TPLF's 2021 counteroffensive got it within spitting distance of Addis Ababa, their forces were finally driven back with the help of Emirati and Turkish drones. That done, all that was left was to mop up the last pockets of resistance. The conflict officially ended on November 2, 2022. By then, over half a million were dead. Tigray region was in ruins, with Amharas occupying western Tigray and Eritrean forces holding territory in the north. The Ethiopian economy had also been shattered, and with federal forces busy in Tigray, the OLA insurgency had been able to run wild in Aromia, taking control of swaths of territory, even briefly entering an alliance with the TPLF during the 2021 counteroffensive. But for all the damage the war had done, Abby had won. The TPLF had agreed to disarm. Now all the Nobel Prize winner had to do was manage the peace, and spoiler alert, in this vital task, he would fail. In doing so, he'd place Ethiopia on track for not only more bloodshed, but perhaps also for full-scale collapse. It takes a special kind of genius to produce a peace agreement that only works to make things more unstable, but that's exactly what happened at the end of the Tigray War. While the USA and international bodies like the African Union were relieved to see a halt to the killing, the way Abby came to make his deal with the TPLF not only alienated all of his former allies, it also paved the way for increased ethnic tension within Ethiopia. Among those ethnicities most outraged by the peace were the Amharas. By the time the Tigray War ended, relations were already deteriorating between Amharan paramilitaries and federal forces. Remember when the TPLF invaded Amhara state, carrying out brutal massacres? Well, most Amharas felt Abiy's government had failed to protect them, that federal forces had been more keen on shielding the capital than stopping the mass murder of their allies. With the war still running, such tensions had been kept in the chiller by the need to defeat the TPLF. Then came the November 2022 peace deal, and it was like Abby whacked up the temperature to nuclear inferno. Amharan and Fano officials were excluded from the talks, talks that ended with an agreement between Addis Ababa and the TPLF to resolve the issue of Western Tigray in accordance with the constitution. It was this last part that set alarm bells ringing in Amhara, since a constitutional solution would suggest Western Tigray must be returned to the Tigray region. From the Amharan perspective, they just fought and survived a brutal war to right a historical wrong and regain well Kate. And now, here Abbey's government was, suggesting the price of peace would be returning this sacred land to the Tigrayans. This is almost the opposite position to the one Abbey took during the war. As the fighting raged, the Prime Minister repeatedly declared that Western Tigray was Amharan. You could almost feel the burning sense of betrayal the peace deal induced. Nor did it only cause problems among the Amharas. The Eritreans were likewise excluded from the talks, despite their invasion from the north being one of the key factors that allowed Abbey to win a civil war. Like the Amharas, the Eritreans felt that they'd been abandoned during the fighting by Ethiopia's federal forces. In this case, when Addis Ababa retreated without warning during the TPLF's counteroffensive, leaving Eritrean forces to be massacred. Like the Amharas, the Eritreans also felt they'd fought and died to regain lands in north of Tigray that they felt were historically theirs. Lands the peace deal now suggested they, as foreign forces, should vacate. Unlike his allies in the war, though, Eritrean dictator Isar Safwerki also had another, more maximalist goal. The complete eradication of the TPLF as a fighting force. Sadly for Afwerki, the TPLF was one thing Abbey's peace deal inadvertently preserved. Inadvertently, because the agreement called for a demobilization of Tigrayan forces. In the early days, many heavy pieces of military equipment were handed over, and hundreds of thousands of Tigrayan fighters sent to demobilization camps. But the process was badly mishandled. Today, over a year after the peace, many are still in the camps, lacking adequate food or shelter and becoming increasingly angry. Meanwhile, the TPLF still has some 270,000 fighters under arms. And the one thing stopping them from reigniting the conflict? Well, that's the promise of Western Tigray. And it's here that we come to the landmine Abbey laid for himself 
in the peace deal. A time bomb tucked away in the details, waiting to explode in everybody's faces. The only thing that convinced the TPLF not to fight to the bitter end was the implicit promise that districts of Tigray region occupied by Amharas and Eritreans would be returned. On the other side, the only reason the Amharas and Eritreans fought with federal forces and didn't turn on them was the promise of keeping these lands they'd occupied. Lands they historically believed to be theirs. Lands they've already shown themselves willing to take up arms to defend. At the time of writing this, in early December 2023, the paradox at the heart of this peace deal is still unresolved, a political bomb that could still yet detonate and plunge Tigray back into war. We'll come to what that means for Ethiopia in the final chapter of today's video. For now, though, we need to turn our attention to one major crisis the issue of Western Tigray has already provoked. A brand new insurgent war between Abiy's federal forces and the Amharas. <laughs> The major thing we want to emphasize with these later chapters today is just how destabilizing to the whole of Ethiopia the Tigray War was. That it was not just a hyper deadly conflict that lasted two years, but also one with consequences that continue to threaten the foundations of the entire country. And this is especially given Abiy Ahmed's strategic choices in the wake of it. Perhaps nowhere is this truer than in Amhara region. The instability began a mere month after the Tigray War's peace deal, when Amhara militaries clashed with the OLA, killing hundreds. But things really kicked off in April 2023. That's when Abiy issued his order that all regional paramilitaries and special forces would have to either be integrated into the federal army or lay down their arms. Rather than obey the government, Amhara region exploded in revolt. The reasons for Amharan disobedience are obvious. In the north, the TPLF still hadn't disarmed. To the south, OLA militants in Aromia still held vast tracts of territory from which they were organizing attacks on Amharan civilians. By following Abiy's order in disarming, the Amharas felt they would be leaving themselves dangerously exposed to their enemies. So instead, many disappeared into the countryside, joined the smaller Farno militias, bringing their guns and wartime experience with them. To which the federal government responded in a way almost guaranteed to exacerbate Amharan fears. Worried about Farno attacks, Abiy set up roadblocks on routes into Addis Ababa. Amharas were banned from entering the capital. Their representatives, including some opposition MPs, were mass arrested. At the same time, the government set out to forcibly disarm the fighters. What happened next was explosive, but also predictable. In August, the brewing conflict in the Amhara region finally stopped being merely brewing and became an actual, full-on, extremely destructive war. In lightning assaults, Farno militias seized major sites in Amhara, including vital airports in the second largest city. Although federal forces managed to regain control, the Farno weren't dismantled. Instead, they slip back into the countryside, back to the rural areas that make up their base of support. They're still fighting out there today. Since August, the Fano insurgency has become just the latest war Abiy's government has overseen. As in Tigray, federal forces have cut all communications networks, so getting information out is difficult. But some stuff still slips through the net, and it sounds unrelentingly grim. For example, there was the government drone strike in November that targeted an elementary school, killing teachers and pupils alike. A few days later, the UN reported that about 50 civilians had been killed over the preceding month. In fact, many Amharas maintain that the violence is far worse than the outside world knows. Speaking to Deutsche Welle, Curtin University researcher Jürgen galore Waldeis declared, I believe there is a genocide happening in Ethiopia, and the world is not talking about it. From this perspective, Abiy is now doing to the Amharas what he so recently did to the Tigrayans, crushing them militarily in the name of breaking up their power base. For Amharas suffering in this latest federal assault, it's a given that the reason is because Abiy is working on behalf of the Oromo, that he wants to gift them Addis Ababa. For an ethnic group that just over a year ago was helping Abiy's forces commit war crimes in Tigray, it is a dramatic reversal in fortunes. A reversal epitomized by the ongoing fears that the government will soon act to evict Amharas from western Tigray. Yet there's a reason for this abrupt shift in the government's stance, and it's not just Abiy trying to break all possible opposition. Up on the northern frontier, another conflict may already be in its early stages, one which has the power to rip back open the barely healed wounds of the Tigray War. Now, every week on this channel, we publish a video called The Situation Room, where we round up the most important stories from the worlds of conflict and geopolitics. As such, we're used to covering stuff that's pretty depressing, crazy, or maybe just some unholy combination of the two. 
But even we weren't really prepared for the sheer awful madness of Abby's renewed threats towards Eritrea. On November the 17th, we released a video covering a whole month's worth of saber rattling by the government in Addis Ababa. The basic gist is that Abby began making veiled threats towards Eritrea, discussing Ethiopia's historic and natural right to a port on the Red Sea. While he never mentioned Eritrea by name, the inference was clear. It was Eritrea that took Ethiopia's seaports with it when it declared independence in 1993, most crucially the port of Asab. As we mentioned what seems like half a lifetime ago back in chapter 2, it was widely understood that the 2018 peace deal Abbey struck with Eritrean President Isar Safwerki included tax-free access to Eritrea's ports. The trade-off was Eritrea laying claim to border areas in the north of Tigray, areas 40,000 Eritrean troops are currently occupying. But the poison peace that ended the Tigray war seems to have killed hopes of access to Assab. And recent troop movements and weapons deliveries to Ethiopia from the UAE suggest Abbey might be seriously considering an invasion of Eritrea to try and annex the port. Rather than a separate crisis, though, uh, we should think of this as one with the potential to compound the conflict happening in our Hara region, to spark off a kind of mega crisis that could make the Tigray War seem like a mere trifle. To win a war against Eritrea, Abbey would likely need to have the TPLF and its 270,000 soldiers still under arms on his side. Since federal forces were committing war crimes against Degrayans just a year ago, you might think such a team-up would be a no-go. But shifting alliances are all just a part of how things roll in modern Ethiopia. While the Tigrayans were brutalized by the government, the real anger is directed at the Eritreans, who were perceived as being particularly savage, not just murdering civilians, but sexually enslaving captured women. If Abbey goes to war with Eritrea, the TPLF might fight alongside him as a way of reclaiming occupied territory. Territory occupied by Eritrea, but also occupied by Amharan forces. That means federal forces would first have to evict Amharas from Western Tigray before joining with the TPLF to defeat Eritrea. But with Western Tigray still under their control, the Amhara militias currently have direct access to Eritrea. Access the Eritrean government, terrified of a potential invasion, might use to funnel weapons to the Amharas to fuel their insurgency. This is why we gave this the clumsy but potentially accurate name of Mega Crisis, because it has the potential to reactivate all the warring parties and bitter grievances of the Tigray War, only now shaken up into a new configuration. As the National Interest recently wrote of a renewed border war, the last time Ethiopia and Eritrea went to war, the conflict lasted two years and cost an estimated 100,000 lives. The current war could potentially plunge the entire region into a crisis that results in both states collapsing. Unnerving as this is, though, we need to stress that our intention with this video wasn't to just demonstrate how a new Ethiopia-Eritrea conflict could cause chaos. Rather, it was to document how a series of decisions made since Abiy Ahmed came to power have put Ethiopia in a position where collapse may be the most likely scenario, where there are now multiple potential trigger points which could send society into freefall. The worst part? It could be that no matter what anyone does, at least one of those triggers is now fated to be pulled. At the end of all that, then, we're left with four major players inside Ethiopia and another one in Eritrea, locked in a sort of Mexican standoff, a zero-sum game where everyone has a non-negotiable thing they want or need but can't get it without pulling the trigger and having the other players fire on them in turn. The federal government needs the TPLF to help it potentially annex a port in Eritrea. If that doesn't happen, at the very least it needs them to disarm. But the TPLF won't do either of those things until Western Tigray has been returned, as hinted at in the peace deal. As New Humanitarian has written, Diplomats fear the dispute over Western Tigray could reignite the war if it is allowed to drag on, and if the TPLF feel they have no option but to take it back by force. Yet the government can't hand over Western Tigray without first clearing it of Amharan forces. If they try to do that, though, the Amharan militias may seek help from Eritrea. This is a major problem, since Abbey's troops are already getting bogged down dealing with the insurgency in Amhara region, an insurgency in which the local civilian population of over 20 million overwhelmingly supports the Fano and where federal power has all but evaporated in the countryside. At the same time, the Oromo, in the form of the OLA, are looking to gain greater control of Addis Ababa, a city completely surrounded by Oromia region. But this vision is unacceptable to the Amhara, who have many kinfolk living in the capital city and fear a massacre like those that befell Amharas living in Oromia. 
Now finally, you have Eritrea, standing just off to the side of the main group, but also with its gun drawn and its own dangerous goals. In this case, to continue occupying parts of northern Tigray and use the Amhara insurgency to prevent an Ethiopian thunder run on its ports. And we haven't really even touched on the involvement of major outside players like the United Arab Emirates, which is clandestinely funneling weapons and money to Abiy's government, or Saudi Arabia, which may back Eritrea if interstate war breaks out in order to thwart Abiy's ambitions. Regardless, it's hopefully clear by now that this is an incredibly complex situation, one made more complex by the mutually exclusive nature of all of these different desires. The Amharans, Tigrayans, and Oromo all currently perceive themselves to be in a zero-sum game, one where they can either get the thing they want or fail and be persecuted. That combination of desire, fear, and feeling of historical grievance is a powerful, powerful driver of war. Just look at the collapse of Yugoslavia, where a similar combination caused utter carnage in the 1990s. Well, what happened in Yugoslavia may wind up looking like a firecracker next to Krakatoa if Ethiopia really erupts. Ethiopia's population, remember, is over 125 million. Of these, the Oromo and Amhara account for tens of millions each, while the Tigrayans are smaller in number but hold outsized influence. As Crisis Group memorably put it, given the competing but interlinked grievances in its three most powerful regions, Ethiopia faces grave risks to its overall stability. The dark vision they see is one in which one of these triggers is pulled with catastrophic consequences not just on the grounds but among the elites. Consequences such as the nation dividing so sharply along ethnic lines that even those Amharas and Oromo in government or in the federal military turn on one another. To quote the group again, unless it is arrested, a burgeoning power struggle between politicians from Ethiopia's two largest regions threatens even wider turmoil and even nationwide civil war. If that happens, then it's likely we'll see a conflict beyond anything we saw, even in Tigray, a kind of scaled-up version of Bosnia's civil war, with all of the horror that that implies. To be clear, we're not saying this will necessarily happen. History is full of less talked about moments, like, say, the annexation crisis of 1908, when whole continents stepped up to the brink of war, only to tiptoe back at the last moment. Maybe that is what's going to happen here. What we are saying, though, is that this would be a tough balancing act, even with a deft dealmaker in charge. Unfortunately, Ethiopia is currently stuck with a guy who is less a master of consolation uh, than someone with a penchant for conflict. And really, that's been the theme of this entire video. That while he may have cut a reassuring figure on stage in Oslo four years ago, Abiy Ahmed has, in reality, overseen an era of bloodshed in his nation unmatched since the fall of the Derg in 1991, an era in which his philosophy of togetherness, of Moderna, has masked a sharp increase in ethnic division. One that could have catastrophic consequences for tens of millions of people. Is Abiy Ahmed the most dangerous man in Africa? Maybe it's a little hyperbolic to say so, but he certainly has the potential to take that title unless he treads very carefully. Back in 2021, an Ethiopian diplomat who quit in disgust at his government's war in Tigray tried to sum Abiy up to CNN. Speaking to the network, Bahane Kidamariam declared of the Prime Minister, instead of fulfilling his initial promise, he has led Ethiopia down a dark path toward destruction and disintegration. It'll only be in the coming years that we'll be able to see if this assessment is correct. If it really is the fate of the man who not so long ago won the Nobel Peace Prize to ultimately destroy his nation in the fires of war.